Hello, everybody. It is my pleasure to introduce Mark Matusik, although I'm sure he doesn't need an introduction for so many of you. I've waited so long, so long to get to know this gentleman. I knew about his work and I knew about him for years, for years before we had the opportunity to meet. And so to be able to do a course with him is really, honestly, I'm bubbling with excitement. That said, Mark, welcome. Thank you, Carolyn. It's good to be here. Really, I can't tell you. I'm not, I'm not just gibbering. I'm telling you the truth. So, Mark, the first thing I'd like to do is to have you share a little bit about your background with him. And I'm sure most people know because you are a very well-known author. Sure. Well, I started as a reporter in when I was in my 20s in New York, and I was in the pop journalism field. I worked for Andy Warhol at Interview Magazine, and I was climbing the sort of publishing ladder. And then I had a life and death breakdown uh, in my late 20s. I was diagnosed with a disease that was supposed to kill me within five years. So I quit my job. I went to India. I started to meditate. I started to ask myself questions about what this life meant. I didn't want to die as ignorant as I was at that time. And it, it turned my life around completely. Uh, and I realized that a catastrophe, you know, the word catastrophe comes from the Greek for turn around. And that's, 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 that's what happened for me in my life is I, I realized that I was a seeker at heart. And then what really interested me was self-knowledge and self-inquiry. So I changed my professional life. I did not uh, end up checking out, which was a lucky thing. And so for the last 30 years, I've really devoted myself as a writer, as a teacher, to the question of human unfolding. And what does it mean to actually know ourselves? And how do we get so lost on the path of... Uh, of self knowledge by the distractions of the world. Yeah. And so I've written a bunch of books and about 15 years ago, I started teaching uh, sort of half time and I developed a method called writing to awaken, which is uh, using writing as a tool for self inquiry. Mm -hmm. uh, sort of based on the idea that when you tell the truth, your story changes and when your story changes, your life is transformed. Is and it that, the truth? It's been my experience as a as a an individual, as a writer, and as a teacher. So I love doing that. So I split half of my time between writing uh, and between and teaching, and it's it's turned out to be a, a great balance. Yes, indeed. And how did you become so fascinated with Ralph Waldo Emerson? I was in graduate school. I was quite depressed and lost, and didn't really want to be in academia. And I happened to fall into a job as a research assistant for a renowned Emerson scholar. I didn't know that at the time. I just needed a job. And so I spent a year helping her finish a book and reading his journals and going through microfiche, if you remember microfiche. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And I'm sorry to say. <laughs> he was locked in the library. And I, he was exactly what I needed at that time. What Emerson gave me that I hadn't had growing up was a vision of what was possible for human uh, development. I grew up in an atheist household of depressive, uh, kind of cynical, um, uh, fallen Jews, I like to call them. <laughs> and it was for me, it, it, was an, it was an awakening to a different vision of what was possible in human life. You know, when he talked about God, even though I didn't believe in God, uh, I understood what he was talking about when he said, you have to listen to the whisper only you can hear. I understood what he meant. So for me, it was a real salvation meeting Emerson. And then he's been my touchstone ever since. You know, for 40 years, I, wherever I travel, I have the little portable Emerson with me. He's gotten me through so many uh, tough spots. And he's, he continues to be a, a source of great, great inspiration for me. There's an organic holy wisdom to Emerson. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. There's something which is what made me so excited about the course you put together, which is what I would like to now discuss. Um, in, in particular, what, what I was so thrilled about was that in my work, um, 
I really feel that the way people suffer today is very different than the way they suffered before. Mm-hmm. And before, and I, I think the depth of suffering has shifted. Um, and I think part of the reason is that so many people have become seekers. Seeking has become mainstream. And it wasn't before. And I say before, before the nuclear age, we have morphed into people who are very monastic while not being in the monastery, very spiritual while not being religious, very, our inner space is the new frontier. Inner and outer space are the two new frontiers. And so people ask questions that are actually prayers. You know, for what reason have I been born? What am I doing here? What's the meaning? These are, these are who are they asking? These are prayers. And so the, the kind of suffering that engages is the suffering of the unanswered prayer that they think is going to come from the intellect, but it doesn't. What it does is awaken exactly what you are going to teach about, which is, well, then look at your contradictions. Look at your forces. And so talk to me about this course. I'm so excited about this course because, as we were saying before we came on the call, contradiction is one of the primary sources of suffering for people. We don't understand how we can be so generous and so stingy uh, on any given day, how we can be so benevolent and so mean uh, within the course of an hour. How is it that we contain these multitudes, you know, as as uh, Walt Whitman put it, yeah. you know, we contain masses of contradictions and there's nothing wrong with that, provided we aren't uh, thinking in a perfectionist uh, way about what we're supposed to be or get falling into a kind of purity mentality. Right. So Emerson, Emerson was always saying that we need to allow for what he called the law of compensation, which is that for every strength, you have a weakness. For every climb, you have a fall. For every expansion, you have a contraction. And getting oh, it, that's it. part of our natural, our natural cycle. That's uh, the organic within us that's the that's the movement within us exactly and when you get that it's it ends the war and this idea that we're not supposed to have these this all of this variety all of this diversity but the fact is we have many voices inside us we have many impulses inside us and that's exactly as it should be so in this course i want to work with emerson's teachings on nonconformity, which was very important to him inconsistency you know he famously said a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds really <laughs> <laughs> when we when we fall into this idea that because i was this way on monday i need to be that way on tuesday we lose our originality we lose our spontaneity and we lose the uh, freedom of experimenting and taking risks that's the other thing he said is that your life is like a laboratory for experiments allow yourself to experiment uh, and don't be afraid of making mistakes. You know what I love so much about this, Mark, is that somehow the idea of becoming consistent and perfection and perfectionism, yeah. consistency and perfectionism have become goals that people equate with being uh, healthy, with being um, balanced and balanced, but even the, the very nature of it is opposites that you manage to dance with. Right. Exactly. You, you know, so this to me is like a course that says, oh, wow, I can, I just have to learn how to dance with these two forces, not filled with self-loathing because once again, I've been cruel to someone I love. Mm -hmm. or I, I need to understand this. Yeah. Understand it and don't get lost in the story of therefore I'm a flawed person who will never attain enlightenment or perfection or uh, communion, whatever you call it. No, not at all. I like what Annie Lamott says. She says that perfectionism is the voice of the oppressor. <laughs> it's true. It, <laughs> Annie's it's, great. It's the oppressor within yeah. us. Yeah. Uh, and, and, the other thing that Emerson says that's really important is that we can't touch into our own genius. 
He believed that we all have a kind of genius inside us, a kind of tutelary deity that we're born with. We can't touch into that if we're afraid of the duality right. within ourselves. Right. Right? And that's where originality comes from. Right. It's from that duality and learning to use your limitations as a springboard to something that's unique. And that's, that's, what, we're, that's what the class is about. May I ask you now to describe the four sessions? Sure, absolutely. Right absolutely. Uh, the first session is on originality and nonconformity. And I'm understanding that, as Emerson said, uh, without being nonconformist, we can't touch into our own power. So we have to be willing to go against the majority, to listen to uh, the whisper that only we can hear. Mm -hmm. And learn to be ourselves regardless of the context where we find ourselves. So to not lose ourselves in the crowd, mm -hmm. to not give away our power uh, to the crowd. And as well as originality, you know, we're going to be looking at originality and genius, how originality is connected to contradiction and self-acceptance. Mm -hmm. uh, and also in the first class, I'll be giving an introduction to Emerson. Who was this guy? Mm -hmm. you know, how did he become so great? And one of the things I love about Emerson is he, he was such a flawed human being. That's really why I fell in love with him, uh, because he struggled so hard. You know, this was not a guy who was destined for greatness. Uh, Remember that great quote when he went to visit Thoreau in jail? And he said to Thoreau, what are you doing in jail? And Thoreau said, what are you doing out of jail? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 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 Oh, my God, I loved it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And in, in the uh, third class, we're going to be talking specifically about Thoreau. The second class, the second uh, session is about adversity and resilience. And this is huge. And it actually goes to what we were just saying about understanding the dark and the light, the, the duality in our lives. You know, Emerson said, he who hasn't been shown the house of pain has seen but half the universe. Oh. We have to allow for pain to be a part of our our human, uh, our human experience, and to not push it away, to understand that it's actually a deepening, it's a kind of fertilizer in the garden of the self, and that if we're rejecting the parts of the, our lives that are painful or adverse, we miss, we miss the lessons. You know, he says that that a a person who cares about waking up will not miss the lessons of her or his own obstacles and, and losses and pain. And also resilience and resilience as a natural part of uh, the organic life, that everything in nature regenerates, everything in nature begins again. Uh, and again, we're, you know, so we're talking again about the cyclical nature of things and allowing that grief has its time, but not staying in grief. You know, grief, he talks a lot about the interior versus the exterior life. And em for Emerson, grief was part of the exterior life. It was part of the experiential life. Mm -hmm. So it's not to deny what happens to us. That's hard, but not to uh, confuse it with who we are, what we are essentially, which mm -hmm. is that unchanging spirit. Mm -hmm. The third session is about paradox and contradiction mm -hmm. and paradox as a spiritual practice. You know, this, this is something that's always fascinated me that, that life is all paradox. There's nothing in our experience that isn't paradoxical and there's nothing wrong with that you know as we were saying earlier a lot of people think oh there's something wrong with that if there's if if, if there's if the opposite is also true au contraire you know yeah. that means that you're in the line of what's real don't you think well, I, I don't like starting a question that way do you think as i i have often that paradox is part of the nature of god what looks very big is actually often very small. What looks very small is actually where the the, the mustard seed is off in the mountain in, in disguise. And 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 it's the capacity to recognize, and this is where humility comes in. The humble can see the gift in the small. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Emerson said the great man is always willing to be little. There you go. And, you know, and, and it's true. So paradox, understanding that two things can be true at the same time right. uh, without either one canceling each other out. Mm -hmm. And that's another definition of wisdom, mm -hmm. you know, understanding that, you know, that God is great, that God is small, that we're both imminent and embodied and physical and material and transcendent and numinous 
uh, and spiritual and that both are true uh, and that they don't have to, one doesn't have to, um, we don't have to simplify everything down to a kind of linear uh, way of seeing. And all or nothing. We're either all good. And I, I can't, I think, I cannot tell you what a handicap it is that people think that way because they think if I'm not totally healthy, I'm not healthy. Exactly. If I'm not totally healed, then I'm not healed. If I'm not totally happy, then I'm not happy at all. Yeah. And it, it's, you can be both. You are both. Mm -hmm. You are. And if you're waiting for perfection, if you're waiting to be all one thing, uh, you're going to die waiting. You yeah, know, right. it, 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 it doesn't happen. Right. So it's about being in what's real. Right. And what I love about Emerson is that as, as spiritual as he, as he was, he was the father of transcendentalism. You know, after all, he was extremely grounded in the reality of what it meant and means to be a flawed, struggling, limited human being. Right. And that give, that's, makes his story so poignant. For me, if that teaching could come out of that life, which was a hard life, he yeah. lost his father when he was nine. He lost his first wife when he was uh, in his 20s. He lost his firstborn son. He yeah. was uh, he was excommunicated from Harvard, his you know alma mater, uh, for being such a pagan and such a pantheist. <laughs> right. He had a lot of struggle in his life. So if out of that kind of a life, this sublime teaching can come, to me, that gives a lot of hope uh, mm. for, for all of us. Uh, and the, the fourth session is called Vitality, Nature, and Love. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to be talking about Hildegard of Bingen's uh, idea of viriditas, the greening power. That's mm -hmm. very central to Emerson's teaching, mm -hmm. uh, the greening power, the thing in us that rises up out of, out of darkness. And learning to harness ourselves to that by surrendering to what is and the including the painful things in our lives and the natural way of things. Uh, Emerson was, as we were saying uh, about Thoreau, he was he and Thoreau were nature buddies. Most of their best times were spent tromping through the woods around around uh, Concord. Mm -hmm. uh, and Thoreau was his teacher in nature. He was his real. He was his his tutor. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to be talking about nature as it relates to self reliance and the the philosophy that Emerson put forth, and also love, love as being, talk about paradox. Mm -hmm. That to under, If we don't understand duality and can't accept limitation in our character, we can't possibly love another human being or allow love to, you know, come toward us. You know, I, I love what Thomas Merton says. He says, prayer and love are learned in the hour when prayer becomes impossible and the heart is turned to stone. Isn't that the truth? It's the truth. It's when you can't pray, it's when you can't love and need to take that one step further, that's when you learn yeah. what, you're, what you're really made of. So that's going to be the, the last session of the class. And so it, it's, I think it will capture Emerson's teaching. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously we can't do everything in four sessions, but it really gets to the heart of what he was trying to communicate. What a beautiful course. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm so excited about this, and 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 having you as a teacher, and and I can I can feel how much you love this, and I know it's going to radiate to the audience, and and let me let me say to everybody, the course begins on April 16th and 18th, and then the following week, the 23rd and 25th, and I hope you will join us because I know it's going to be magnificent. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Carolyn.